So, Mr. Chase, is the hot tub time machine fixed or what? I've got someone to be. You're good to go. Excellent. I got my hoverboard here. I'm ready to get back to the future. By the way, uh, how'd you get the jacuzzi working again? Some sort of sticky liquid got under the uh, crossover housing. Uh... Okay, seriously, Chevy? That's disgusting. Worked out for you and the boys, though. Great. So I stole plutonium from the Libyans for nothing. All I'm saying is, whatever your poison, I wouldn't tub without it. Well, I gotta get going then, because this is movie night. Hello and welcome to Movie Night, in-depth film reviews in less than five minutes. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. For the third time on the show, we're taking a look at time travel movies. Specifically, we're focusing on five newer and less known titles from this interesting subgenre. We begin with Primer. This science fiction drama film won the Grand Jury Prize at the 2004 Sundance Film Festival and eventually scored 424,000 at the box office following a limited release in October of that year. On a minuscule budget of only 7,000, former engineer and mathematics graduate Shane Currith basically created this entire picture by himself, serving as director, producer, writer, actor, composer, and editor. So let that be a lesson to aspiring filmmakers. If you have a dream and enough money to buy a used Toyota Corolla, you really can make a feature film all by yourself. The PG-13 rated plot follows Carruth and David Sullivan as two fledging entrepreneurs who inadvertently build a time machine in their garage and begin experimenting with it. Interestingly though, the phrases time travel and time machine are never once used in the complicated script, which has not been simplified at all for audiences. In a medium saturated with dumbed down exposition, this intelligent approach is certainly commendable, but it can also be frustrating. The audience is largely kept in the dark as we watch the brainy protagonists solve their scientific dilemmas. Their performances are serviceable for the technical aspects, but when it comes to the picture's few dramatic moments, it's obvious they're amateurs. Although Primer is a very short 77 minutes, the material is so dense it feels like a much longer production. There's no fad on the story. Everything has been trimmed down to the bare essentials of storytelling. And for better or worse, there is absolutely zero backstory or character development, as the narrative begins without an introduction as to who these people are or what they're doing. The audience is given no clue as to whether they're building a transporter or a toaster oven. Eventually, though, we see they've constructed a pair of refrigerator-sized boxes that allow its occupants real-time backwards movement through the fourth dimension. It's extremely fascinating to see how these characters analytically use this power in incrementally more courageous amounts, first to make modest income on the stock market, and later to stop violent attacks. We've seen a lot of crazy things lately, okay? And I know you're still trying to put it all together in a way that makes oh, sense. You get it. No, no, I don't. Look, I just want you to understand that what's next is not a prank, okay? I wouldn't do that to you, and, and I'm not doing that to you. So when you see this, the one with can't yell or, or make any noise or run anywhere, okay? I know, I know you probably feel like you're being tricked or made fun of, but you're not, okay? I promise you, you're not, okay? Who's that, eh? Remarking on paradoxical consequences, Carruth questions his friend, what's worse, thinking you're being paranoid or knowing you should be? Often bathed in overly orange hues, the visuals here are decidedly plain and unremarkable. Carruth's abilities as an editor, however, are a touch better, utilizing the occasional jump cut to illustrate the character's disorientation when time shifting. For those interested in the hypothetical science of time travel, this picture does a fantastic job of exploring those concepts and ideas. And if you manage to understand all of the temporal twists, you're a smarter person than I am, because even after a second viewing, I had a very difficult time figuring this one out. The movie just sort of ends, though, without properly examining the moral implications of manipulating the timeline. Primer may be dry and complicated, but it's extremely fascinating, and a good movie. For tonight's poll question, what's the most confusing film you've ever seen? Leave your response as a comment below. Next up, on the opposite end of the scientific spectrum, is Hot Tub Time Machine. The sophomore effort from director Steve Pinn was released nationwide in March of 2010, where it just about doubled its $36 million budget. When a malfunctioning jacuzzi sends four friends back in time to a wild night of debauchery in the winter of 1986, they must avoid anything that could alter the future. The sci-fi comedy sees John Cusack, Rob Corddry, and Craig Robinson inhabiting the bodies of their younger, crazier teenage selves, while Clark Duke tries to ensure his very existence. While it's nice to see Cusack back in his most familiar decade, his performance is hardly a highlight. Instead, it's Corddry and Robinson who are the standout players, the former exhibiting perpetual immaturity in the face of violent sex and temporal escapades, while the latter brings a great deal of moral integrity to the chauvinistic proceedings. The supporting cast includes a quick part from Lizzie Kaplan, the inspired inclusion of Crispin Glover, once again stuck dealing with time travelers, 
and Chevy Chase appears as a mystical hot tub repairman for good measure. Even though it seems like the entire concept for this 101 minute feature was reverse engineered from its ridiculous title, the plot actually works, bouncing from gross out humor to 80s satire to touching moments between friends. A recurring gag involving the impending amputation of Glover's arm is particularly amusing, largely thanks to Cordry's bloodlust. The initial time shifting sequence is accomplished with a frenzy of great editing and an explosion of sound effects. Trying to explain the magical properties of the titular bath, Duke questions, do I really gotta be the asshole who says we got in this thing and went back in time? The R-rated script is filled with crude language, suggestive situations, and a few spectacular instances of female nudity. We can dance Still if we want to. That's true. We can leave your but the facts behind. should be evidence. Cause your friends you don't know. dance and if they don't oh, dance, they don't dance. Know. Dude is rocking cassette player. Just relax, I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation Don't for all this shit. Don't tell me the reason. Just relax, just for a minute. Please, warmers. Jerry Curl, where's the beef? Excuse me, miss. What color is Michael Jackson? Black. <laughs> When Cordry and Duke argue about the benefits of a male-male-female three-way, it's hard, no pun intended, not to laugh at their dilemma. The costume design from Dana Pink, no relation to the film's director, is a fantastic throwback to the 1980s, mixing colorful leg warmers with big hair and flashy jackets. Meanwhile, the soundtrack contains plenty of great period tunes, from The Cutting Crew to Motley Crew. While the temporal backdrop of this story isn't explored as much as I would have liked, it's a clever setup to a fun and childish 80s comedy that ends with a wonderful coda. The well-paced adventure actually has a surprising amount of character depth, though, as it focuses heavily on themes of regret, second chances, and diminishing friendships. Between all of the puking, screwing, and punching, the movie actually has some heart, and it's worth seeing a couple times. Hot Tub Time Machine has crass but endearing characters in absurd situations. And here's what you had to say about it. Although it only had a few laugh out loud moments, this is a fun movie that incorporated interesting time travel elements. We both thought it was cool. Next up, Predestination. This project by Australian directors Michael and Peter Spirig premiered at South by Southwest in March of 2014 and is an adaptation of renowned science fiction writer Robert A. Heinlein's short story, All You Zombies. The cheap $3.4 million production stars Ethan Hawke as a temporal agent, recovering from a disfiguring accident who must stop the one criminal who has eluded him throughout time. Hawke has always gravitated towards interesting projects, and he once again turns in a nuanced performance that anchors this picture's confusing concept in a necessary way. The 97-minute narrative stays intimate, mostly revolving around only two characters, the other played by Sarah Snook in a breakout performance. Portraying a woman before and after transgender surgery, she's effectively required to play a dual role, and is wonderful at both. Time travel is used merely as a mechanism to explore different aspects and time periods of her life, as the R-rated story deals more with her struggle of self-identity than anything else. Alluding to the titular nature of the universe, Snook asks, don't you think that things are just inevitable? It's this central question that seems to drive the characters, as the actions they take set up situations necessary for their very existence. Avoid trying to wrap your head around these circular paradoxes, though, as it'll just leave you with a headache. It's impossible for me to share specific examples and scenes from Predestination without spoiling massive amounts of the plot, so I'll simply say that this picture is one worth experiencing for yourself, with little foreknowledge. There are, however, some interesting and resonating themes about self-worth and figuring out your purpose in life. Our first mission is just as important as our last, each one getting us closer to our final destination. Sir, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to uphold the rules and regulations set forth by TBR code 7286? I do. Do you accept that any diversion from your mission parameters will result in the immediate court-martial, and if convicted, death by lethal injection? I do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The wide two-by-one canvas frames the actors with clean close-ups and strong lighting. Although the environments are seldom explored, we do get brief glimpses of period costumes and locations, which are handled well. Culminating with a series of compounding twists, the movie left me asking, what the hell did I just watch? It's not that it doesn't make sense, but it's understanding the implications of these reveals that will leave you scratching your head for hours after the credits roll. A must-watch for all fans of time travel, I thought Predestination was a compelling and introspective four-dimensional narrative, and a great film. Next up tonight, Time Lapse. This low-budget indie flick had its world premiere in April of 2014 at the Brussels International Fantastic Film Festival. 
Making his directorial debut with the sci-fi thriller, Bradley Kane crafts a very intriguing premise around time travel that never actually has anyone traveling through time. When three friends discover a mysterious camera that takes pictures of the future, they conspire to use it for personal gain until more disturbing images turn them against one another. Even though there are a few supporting players, 90% of this picture revolves around this trio, played by Daniel Pennebacher, Matt O'Leary, and George Finn. The 101 minute plot is heavy on backstory and character motivation, allowing these talented actors to handle the high concept premise with plenty of believability. Afraid to tamper with the bootstrap paradox, Finn is quick to remind everyone, we gotta do what's in the photo, which often includes curious events and circumstances the group doesn't always agree with. Watching them rationalize betrayal and dangerous behavior just for the obedience of time itself leads to a great deal of drama. Pennebacher is forced to cheat on her boyfriend right in front of him just because it was in the photo from the future. We need to consider the possibilities. Well, one possibility is we've all been dosed with lethal amounts of radiation that, you know, could have killed Mr. B. Okay, negative Nancy, but what if we could use this thing? How? Remember how Mr. B took a photo of himself holding that sign? What if we put up, like, the newspaper? We would know what happens in the future. You know, the newspaper, Jasper? What are you thinking, arts and entertainment, or are you thinking the race results? Oh. Well, what if? I mean, think about how much money we could make. But I'm curious why anyone living in a ground floor apartment with a huge picture window would constantly leave the lights on and the shades open late at night. I had a place like that once and it felt like living in a fishbowl. Our blinds were always down. I was disappointed too that more wasn't done with the concept. The actions made by the characters were often frustrating and not very ambitious. These low income individuals can see into the future, but they waste their time betting on local horse races? Why not just buy a lotto ticket and be done with it? The narrative is cleanly shot and tightly edited, progressing logically at a decent clip. The score, meanwhile, by Andrew Kaiser uses deep, repetitive strings and loud piano chords to really amp the suspense, which makes waiting for the next Polaroid to drop actually somewhat frightening. Despite its extremely limited scope, the movie basically takes place in a single apartment complex with only five speaking roles, there's enough here to satisfy by most fans of temporal mischief. Time lapses, simplistic setup results in apprehension and intrigue. I thought it was a great film. Finally tonight, my review of Project Almanac. This science fiction thriller, director Dean Israeliite's inaugural effort, more than doubled its budget only a month after its January 30th, 2015 release. The 106 minute story follows a group of teens who use secret plans to build a portable time machine, which results in exciting windfalls and disastrous possibilities. 26 year old Johnny Weston plays the brainy lead, who bounces from ambition to awkwardness pretty well. Sophia Black Diali is his beautiful high school crush, and the familiar romance between them actually has some sweet moments. The rest of the adolescent players aren't worth mentioning though, except for Virginia Gardner, who is especially unconvincing as the disembodied voice behind the camera. The construction and invention process of the time machine, built out of car batteries and Xbox 360 and some circuit boards, is handled with just enough faux science to make it believable. While childish, it's still pretty fun to see them use their time-hopping abilities for blatant personal gain, which includes winning the lottery, passing a science test, and getting revenge on a bully. Me personally, I'm gonna take it easy at first, you know, I'm gonna get a yacht, you know, then see see what happens, go from there. Okay, you, know? uh, you guys do know that 1.8 million after taxes isn't enough for what you wanna do. You should save it. Pay for college. I'm sorry, I thought you just said 1.8. You guys only got five out of six numbers. Why did you put 44? Because that's what you put down. That is not what I put down. I put a nine. That is a nine. That's 49, oh, Adam. You have to go back and do it again. Shh. I, I am not winning the lottery twice. Come on now, guys. Come on. This is great. Despite their access to literally unlimited time though, the group always seems to be in a rush for some reason. With some obvious nods to Back to the Future and similarities to the compounding mistakes of the butterfly effect, this movie still manages to carve out its own place in the time travel niche with some unique concepts and imagery. A shot where Alan Evangelista sticks his hand outside of the temporal wake during the frightening moments before a jump is a particularly cool visual. But the PG-13 rated film really gets interesting when the narrative graduates from the temporal field trips and sophomoric pranks to explore the consequences of manipulating the timeline. Evangelista the laments, whatever we did had some crazy ripple effects. There's effective suspense late in the picture as well, when the tapestry of the space-time continuum begins to unravel. Project Almanac's found footage style presentation is its Achilles heel though. The constant documentation, including some rather private moments, is rarely believable, even if the characters themselves point out this fact. The diegetic cinematography is plagued with unmotivated shakes and annoying digital glitches that hide frequent jump cuts. Plus, the audio is obviously not coming from the camcorder. How else are we able to hear an intimate exchange between the attractive leads in the middle of a music festival? from 50 feet away. The twist ending conclusion is a satisfying one, but upon closer reflection, it actually reinforces that these characters never learn from their mistakes. I'm reminded of George Santayana's famous quote, 
Those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. An ironic, if appropriate, theme for a time travel film. In spite of its glaring flaws, though, this movie is a really fun story I wouldn't mind seeing twice. Project Almanac is an intriguing and enthusiastic temporal adventure, hampered by a distracting style. Here's what you had to say about it in the YouTube comments. Critical of the confusing plot, dumb characters, and cheesy effects, you thought this movie was only meh. In an extremely rare occurrence, I scored this a full three points higher with a seven. Finally tonight, a look at some tweet critiques. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review at the JPMN hashtag. In an effort to catch up on some personal work and other projects, next week I'll be sharing my thoughts with a random collection of pre-written but unfilmed reviews. They're on The Russia House, The Joneses, The Bourne Legacy, Blue Ruin, and Everly. Most of these films aren't that popular, so I don't expect you to have seen them. But if you feel like watching them before next Friday, please leave your reviews in the comments below. If you'd like to watch more Movie Night videos, check out the related reviews on the right, or click subscribe to be notified of all new content. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for updates and exclusive content between episodes. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.